Okay, so I guess uh, let's start the class. <laughs> Even though there's not many students. Uh, we stopped here last time. So we talked about some comets. So some of them takes forever, you know, to come back. Some of them don't come back. And we talked about the Halibob comet. So it's uh, it has a period of 2,533 years. So we won't be alive when it's coming back. And the last encounter was in 1995. And I talked about what happened in 1995, um, the, the sect and the mass suicide, because they thought that with the comet will arrive a spacecraft okay, taking the soul of people who had committed a suicide and take them to heaven. So that's why the, the gate was called uh, Heaven's Gate. So we talked about that last time. So I went back a little bit here. So we have Heli Comet. So we talked about it a lot in the first unit. And it comes back every about 76 years. Okay, so it's named after Edmund Heli. So he's the one who figured out that it was the same comet coming back 76 years. And here you can see the comet in the tapestry. So that's a very old, early Middle Age. In that tapestry, they tell the story of uh, William the Conqueror. He was, I think he was the Duke of Normandy in France, and he invaded England. So it's a very famous story. And here you have the poor English king about to die. His name was Harold. And um, so it was also in this uh, picture, very famous picture from Gaiotto. You know, the I don't know if I say it right, but he was the Italian painter. And here you have the adoration of the mages. And you can also see the heli comet. So he used the heli comet for um, the painting of the Bethlehem uh, star, the star of Bethlehem. So that was in 1305, I think. And then in 1985, they sent, so last time the comet visited us, it was in 18, 1985. Next time will be in 2060 something, 61 or 64. So I won't be around, but hopefully it will be. So in 1885, when the comet came to visit the Earth, right, it was very close to the Earth, they sent a spacecraft to... Um, observe that comet here. So you see it's like a dirty snowball. And the spacecraft was European and it was named Gaiotto, named after the very famous painter. Okay, so I don't know if I have, let's see if I have a video about that encounter. Gaiotto, 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 here. Rocket is French, okay, but now it's uh, belong to European Space Agency, and uh, it's uh, it always launched from Guyana. So Guyana is in South America, and you have French Guyana. So that's where it's launched from. So close to the equator.
happened in 1985. Okay, so that was a nice video. So as I've said, 1985-1987, uh, it was very close to the sun. So it had a beautiful tail. And now it's very, very far, right? As, as far as it could be. And you see it's close to the Pluto orbit. And when it's coming back, it's going to be in 2060 something. So 61, 2061. So hopefully you will be wrong. Okay. So another very interesting mission happened in 2004. And uh, it was the mission was named Stardust. So what they did here, they had like a, a small, it's like a, um, uh, like a net, okay? So the, the spacecraft here had a small net and the net was made of some kind of gel. So it's some kind of weird material. So it's high technology to try to trap and collect material from a comet. So that was done really for the first time ever. And that gel here is called aerogel. So you see here, the dust from the comet enter here the gel and, and then you can send back the sample to Earth to be analyzed. So that was a very successful mission and it's called Star Dust. So if you are interested, you can look it up, look it, look it up here to have more details to find what, what did they discover. What we really want to find out is that if you can find organic material you know, in, in space. So maybe life started in space and then seeded the Earth. So that's one theory. So anyway, and then they did it again in 2011. Okay, so 2004, it was a fly, uh, close, close fly, close to Y2 comet. And 2011, it was flying uh, close to the comet Temple 1. So we have many, many comets flying around and it was collecting just from the comet. That's quite impressive. So very good, a very interesting uh, uh, mission. And you see it was done by the Astrobiology Department of NASA. So looking for life possibly and analyze what dust from comets are made of. Okay, and then you had another mission, also very interesting, and it's called the Deep Impact. So Deep Impact was a collision. So they, they had a projectile hitting a comet, okay, to have all this material upside down to see what's, what is inside the comet. So that happened in 2005, and that was called Deep Impact. And the comet, the target was Temple 1. Uh, apparently, they find new stuff, new findings about comet, their composition, water, ice, organic materials as well. So it's not because they find organic materials that life is possible, okay? It's not, um, it's not necessarily a correlation. So deep impact, I have a very nice video here that I have found for you. So this amount of activity, more than two weeks. By the way, that, that video comes from your book, uh, Cosmos in the New Millennium. This amount of activity, more than two weeks before the deep, deep impact collision, um, suggested that there would be a fair amount of stuff ejected during the collision, because already the comet was, was pretty active and pieces were breaking off. Here it is, here is an artist's conception of what the impactor might look like right when it's nearing the, the comet. And here is an animation showing the whole process. So there is deep impact, releasing a 370 kilogram projectile. And the cameras on the deep impact spacecraft 
turned in such a way as to watch the projectile as it got close to the comet and hit the comet with a speed of 10 kilometers per second. This is like a bullet hitting a bullet in the middle of, of empty space. And so all this stuff got ejected, and then the cameras and the spectrographs on the deep impact spacecraft could study. Do you see? He said spectrograph, right? So it's like uh, spectrometry or spectroscopy. It means that they, they analyze the spectra and from there they, they will tell what's the composition of this cloud of dust and ice. So they will know the composition of whatever is inside the comet. Okay, so I think this is very cool. Either ejected, ejected material, material and determine and its composition, composition and watch the trajectories of the ejected, ejected material, material and thus and determine the gravity, gravity and the mass of the comet. And all, and all sorts, sorts of interesting things, things were found out about the comet, the comet as a result. As a result. So, so this... this okay, so that was a very cool uh, mission. So it was called Deep Impact. Okay, so I stop here for a track time. Uh, so who I have a phone with What's your name over there? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Ah, Kiava, you sent me an email, right? And the sunglasses boy. Charles. And here. What's your name? Don't space out. No. Yes. Oh, I did, I did, sorry. Okay. So I have everyone, right? Do I have you, Kimberly? Okay, I stop. So I already gave you extra credit for last time. Okay, so deep impact. So you can see here how they did it. You see Earth, that was Earth at launch. Remember Earth goes counterclockwise. This is the orbit of Temple 1, which is a comet here, Temple 1, you see its orbit, and then they launched, they launched deep impact, and there is an encounter here in 2005, okay? So that's when they sent a projectile to see what's going on inside the comet. So that was a very nice mission. Now, when you're looking each time, so what's a meteor shower? Each time the Earth you see? So that will be the Earth, that will be the orbit of a comet, but not necessarily. It could be also an asteroid. And you see the asteroid or the comet has also little junks, okay, that broken off, that were breaking off maybe because of the Sun or Jupiter. So anyway, you have all the, those little pieces here. So when those pieces here, you know, you see, will be at the same place and the same time, uh, than, than the Earth, so we, that's when we have a comet, uh, a, a meteor shower, okay? So when, when our orbit is going to cross with the orbit of those junks here, that's when we have a meteor shower. It will look like this, like it's coming from a single point, but that's not what's happening in reality everything will be parallel to each other, right? So it's it's coming parallel, hitting the Earth. From our perspective, it's like an optical illusion. Everything happens like all those meteors are coming from a single point. So it's like spreading out. So you have the same thing here. If you look at the hallway here, very straight, uh, making a line, it seems that it's it's making like this, right? It makes like an angle. It seems like it's spreading out, but it's an optical illusion because it's just straight. Same thing here, when you are looking at a meteor shower, everything happens like it's coming from a single point. When you are looking at the sun, for example, through the trees, it looks also like it's spreading out. Did you have traffic again? We just lay it. Uh, some example of meteor shower. So, for example, here, very famous, you have the Perseid. Okay. Why is it called Perseid? Because it seems to come from the constellation Perseus. 
okay? And that happened during the summer between July 23 and August 22. So you, it, it comes from this comet here. And again, those, those are the junks that the orbit of the sun will cross in, uh, in its orbit. Uh, I had another example here. You have another example, uh, which is called the Leonid. So what do you think Leo means in Greek? Leo, it has also a zodiac uh, constellation, zodiac sign. Leo means lion. You can see the lion here. So the Leonid seems to come from the constellation lion. And every about 30 years, it's going to be even stronger. So some people are really fun, okay? They are very enthusiastic of those meteor shower. Usually in the news, they will tell you when, uh, when to go. There is another one, meteor shower, that happens in uh, December. And they are called the uh, Humanite meteor shower. It happens early December. And you see here, you, you, I don't know if you can recognize, but that's a constellation of Orion. You have Betelgeuse here. You have the belt of Orion. You have the sword of Orion. And here you, you have like a meteor, okay, coming from the Gemini meteor shower. And it's playing tic-tac-toe, right? It's like connecting the dot. So someone in space is playing tic-tac-toe with a meteor and stars which I think is very cool. So that Gemini uh, shower, uh, it doesn't come from a comet, but it comes from an asteroid. Okay, so it's the asteroid and a bunch of junks all around orbiting the sun. You see, it makes a nice ellipse and it goes beyond Mars. Okay, so every December, it's gonna cross our orbit here. And that's when you have those met uh, meteor showers. Okay, so it's between December 6 and December 15. You can go outside and it's a beautiful uh, view. Again, if you have an interview, you say you can say, oh, I'm a, I'm a fan, enthusiast, and I track all those meteor showers over the year, and I guarantee that it will uh, set you aside from other candidates if you are passionate about astronomy. Okay. So Leonid, the, where is my Leonid shower? Here, it's in November, okay? So every November, you can go outside and uh, watch the Leonid uh, meteor shower. So some comets, so each time you have a, a rock, okay, that make it to the Earth, hit the Earth, it could be an asteroid or it could be a comet. Once it's gonna reach the Earth, it's called a meteorite. So it can destroy life on Earth like it did with the dinosaurs like 65 million years ago. And some comets or some asteroids have Earth written, written on it, right? Our name on it. Okay. So this, this is the very famous uh, story here. I already talked about that. Heli Bob it happened in 1996. Okay, so it was all over the news and the sight of the comet was very impressive because you can really see, so that's a picture from back then, you can see the tail made of two parts, plasma and dust. Okay, and I told you about that story. So um, the idea was that this um, comet uh, was coming with a spacecraft with extraterrestrial life. And, and their, um, their mission was to take the souls of, of the people from that sect here. So they all committed suicide. And the soul was supposed, were supposed to depart from the body and go straight to heaven. Very impressive how you can manipulate people. I guess he was very, very good at uh, pub public speaking, at convincing people. So it just take one, one uh, weird guy, one jerk, to uh, to cause the death of many people. So if you are in psychology, it's a very interesting uh, story. 
Okay, so another interesting story. So that was back in the 1970s. Okay, so in 1977, um, late 1970s, they launched two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. So Voyager 2 was launched first, and then Voyager 1 was launched second. So the reason for that is that Voyager 2 didn't take a, to, took a shortcut to leave the solar system. Voyager 1 took its time because it took pictures for, of other planets. So the idea for those spacecraft was to leave the solar system and to send a message to extraterrestrial life. So it's a very interesting story. So I don't know, uh, you, you are too young, but when I was your age, we didn't have all the technology that you had. So when we were listening to music, we used vinyl. Okay, so those vinyl records. So they did the same thing here, except instead of using vinyl, they use gold plated disc here. And in those discs here, they recorded sound and image from the earth. So it's like a phonogram, phonograph. And um, uh, those images and sound from our Earth is meant for extraterrestrial life, given that they have enough technology to be able to read those records. Isn't that cool? Right? Um, it was gold plated. And on that gold plated disc, they even show. Um, possible extraterrestrial life, how to find us in the solar system. So you really have to hope <laughs> that they, they are not mean-minded, but they are friendly, <laughs> because it's like saying, okay, this way, this way, this way. But it's very interesting. So what, what kind of image and sound? So you, you can hear sound of birds and, and rivers and stream. You have a silhouette of a male and female. Um, a pregnant woman, you have also uh, the DNA and all, all kind of images coming from, from Earth. You have about 115 photographs. You also have greeting in 55 languages and you have sound from Earth and even music. So that was so cool. 1970s, you know, in the 1970s, everyone loved science, space. So I think that was a great mission. So here are the pictures. So if you go to the, I think it's NASA. Yes, the website of NASA, you can see some of the images that are recorded in those records. So you have some math, okay? to tell them, you know, we are good at math, we understand this and we understand that. Um, you have a picture of the moon, you see all the craters there. You have pictures of Jupiter with the red spot. You have a picture of the Earth. What else do you have? Uh, you have the structure of the atom with the electrons here, orbit, the orbit of the electron. You have the DNA, okay? They show the DNA in those pictures with the hydrogen bond. And what else do you have? I'm not sure what it is. You have a baby, you have a man and a woman. Woman is pregnant. And you have, oh, they tell, uh, they tell the, the alien, you know, the different stage in, in life, like from baby and uh, uh, preteen and old, adults. Okay, here you have a picture of the Pangea. I don't know if I'm sure you took like an earth science class. So that was back then when all the continents were together. Okay, so at the time of the dinosaurs, before, before it, break, it was breaking down. You can even see that South America, it's like a puzzle, right? You can put South America back to Africa. So those two continents were together. Uh, you have pictures, I don't know what island is this, what else do you have? Uh, Geo, that will be in France this summer in July. The uh, Olympic game will take place in Paris, so it's going to be a big mess over there. Uh, what people uh, eat, 
you know, the, the sad, it's called sad, no? American diet, um, not very healthy here, x-rays. Uh, oh, look at that. Do you remember this one? It's the Arecibo telescope. I think there was one question on that for test number two. The radio telescope in Puerto Rico, at the time it was not broken. It's very sad that it didn't uh, fix it. Oh, you have an astronaut in space. Okay. And what do we have here? You have a page of Principia, the most important uh, book in science, Principia. It was not called physics at the time. It was called natural science. The author is Isaac Newton, of course. And you see how Isaac Newton figured out that if you go high enough on top of the mountain and you shoot a projectile, and if you shoot with a velocity high enough, it's going to orbit. It's going to get into orbit, right? The, the, the smallest orbit will be circular. And then as you increase the speed of launch, you're going to have an ellipse. Isn't that cool? And of course, uh, not to forget uh, music here. Violent, I guess. Violent. But, but, but it's just a sample, okay? You have all the list of the pictures here. Taj Mahal, they have a picture of Taj Mahal, Sydney Opera, very interesting. So you can, uh, I have the link here if you, if you want to look at that. Now, where is it now? So it's, uh, the, the, the solar system is so, so, so big that Voyager 2, so the one that took a shortcut, you see in 2019, it was only there. So it didn't leave the solar system. Maybe it did now, but I'm not sure. We, we will have to check. I will check for next time. But in 2019, it was still inside the solar system because you have the Kuiper belt and then you have the OO cloud. So it takes forever if you don't go fast enough. And you cannot go really fast, right? Because you don't have fuel or very little fuel. To go fast, you have to go to the speed of flight. And if you go to the speed of flight, it will take infinite amount of fuel. So that will not possible. You see Aries that caused the demotion of Pluto. So it's a dwarf planet as well. Okay, any question? So, but before that, before that, in December 73, so this one, so Voyager 2 didn't leave the solar system, but this one did. So in 1973, they launched Pioneer 10. So they didn't have a record with sound and image from the Earth, but they had a golden plate. I think it was made of gold. I'm not sure with what a man looks like, what a woman looks like, and how to find us in the solar system. You see, oh, we are here, this is the Earth, and we left the Earth in 1973. And again, you have to confident that those aliens have a, are very friendly. <laughs> so you, you, interesting also, that was Pioneer 10, and you can look it up here. Okay. So before moving, so remember, April 1st, we have our test online. Um, I have several pictures I want to show you that I forgot to show you. Uh, Saturn, I had a picture of Saturn. Do you see some something like Uranus? Saturn. So Saturn here, you can see the motion of Saturn, which is a very cool animation. It has one. 146 moon. So that's a lot of moon. We have only one moon. Saturn has hundreds of them, and some of them don't even have names. Okay, they are not, not being names. You see, this is the motion of Saturn, and you see all those little moons orbiting Saturn. All those moons, all these are moons, okay? They are zooming out. All you see here, all these clouds here, it's all moons. Titan is a very famous moon. And zooming out, I don't know if you can see. 
Can you see, because the resolution from here is not good, you can see the resolution, you can see all the moons. See? So very cool. And what I see that I show you, okay, a picture here. So here, the ring here of Uranus. Remember, we discussed why the rings of Uranus, it took a while to, 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 to find them, but they are very, 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 very thin. Okay, very thin here. It's a very thin rings and one of the moon here you can see. Okay, so these are called shaper moon. They keep the rings like very close, uh, very thin. Okay, I have another picture I forgot to show you. That was from January 2023. The demoted planet Pluto. You can see what it looks like. Isn't that amazing that we can see that? It's kind of bare, not very welcoming. You see how lucky we have that we can have life on Earth? It's like a goldly luck. Okay, it's just at the right distance from the sun. Not cool to live here, I guess. So that will be Pluto. Another picture here. Okay, so this is from an amateur astronomer. And that's amazing, amazing pictures or videos from the sun in great details. So a few months ago, I featured a creator, amateur astronomer Simon Tang, who goes by the name The Stupid Astronomer. Well, stupid, he is not. He built a backyard telescope that shows the sun in shocking detail, and the majority of the 4.7 million people who saw that video have never seen the sun like this before. But by far, the most prevalent comment that I received on that video is that NASA can't even produce what Simon is doing. And while I agree, NASA is not producing images and videos of the sun exactly like these, they are still producing what I believe to be equally impressive, albeit different, views of the sun. You can very clearly see high detailed videos of the surface of the sun, its solar flares, and the sun's immense magnetic field manipulating huge arcs. So you see those arcs here? Yeah? It's because you have magnetic field lines that will trap charged particles plasma. So you can really visualize those magnetic field lines the plasma that are absolutely dwarfing the size of Earth. So while these two are different, I see them as equally impressive. But if you think that Simon's are better, you should absolutely stop by his page on IG and tell him so. And while you're there, drop some likes for him and mention that Interstellar News sent you. So a few months ago, I... So you can follow him. It's interesting. And then, what is about the sun? Um... Oh, that's the thing I wanted to show you. Did I show you this one, the sun plasma? So that's also the sun. Oh, you see the scale. That's why I choose that picture, because you see the Earth relative to the sun. So you see this, and the sun is not even a big star. It's a really average star. There is nothing special about our sun. Now, what I wanted to tell you, and again, I think interview looks good, is that April 8, we're going to have a solar uh, eclipse. April 8. So in Miami, you it's, it's going to be partial. So it's not going to be total, but... Uh, NASA has a website where you can follow the eclipse, right? You, you can see beautiful pictures. Unless you want to travel on April 8 and... Uh... So this is coming up, right? April 8. Look at this. So what you see here will be the projection. So that will be the projection on the moon of the moon on the earth, right? So an eclipse happens when the moon, it's exactly between the sun and the earth. 
and you see there is a projection of the moon shadow on the earth so if you are here like in miami it will be a partial eclipse so it will be like a gray you know you won't be it won't, will not be a sunny day but if you are there here just here then it will be dark okay but you cannot look at the sun you need those special glasses sunglasses but very special sunglasses you can look at the eclipse and if you look at the eclipse so the the, the moon will be just hiding the sun and you can see the outer atmosphere of the sun so it's a beautiful uh, sight looks like this you see that's the moon and then it goes away So that's what it uh, show you here. If you are anywhere in the US, so then you won't be able to see the sun. Okay, it will be a total eclipse. If you are there, so it will be a partial eclipse. When you experience an eclipse, you feel that connection with space. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Look at the ray structure! The universe is out there and it's affecting us. We are in space. And here it comes, there's the diamond ring. And that is the most spectacular sight. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you haven't seen anything. So you can go on their website and, and watch it live. Okay, any questions so far? So I, um, are we gonna start a new unit now before getting to stars? And that will be catastrophic collision. And it's when the comet or asteroid or any rock hitting the earth, right? So most of the time, the meteorite or meteoroid before it hit the earth, will disappear into the atmosphere. So when you have a, like something aiming at the Earth, it's going to have a lot of kinetic energy, forward kinetic energy, before it gets into the atmosphere. Now, kinetic energy is deadly because it's proportional to the speed square. So if you are on the highway, okay, with your... Uh, Maserati, for example, and all of a sudden you go from 50 miles per hour to 100 miles per hour. So you multiply your speed by two. That means if you crash, if you have an accident, the damage will be multiplied by four. Or if you want, if you multiply your speed by two, it will take four times the distance to stop the car. Just to tell you how much energy you're going to have because the energy, kinetic energy, energy of motion is proportional to the speed square. So multiply your speed by three, the damage, the possible, the potential damage, okay, will be multiplied by nine. And so are the insurance uh, fees, right? And the broken bones and broken everything. So when, when the rock is in space, Okay, it has kinetic energy, nothing bad will happen. But when it's going to enter the atmosphere, all that kinetic energy, forward kinetic energy, is going to turn into heat. Okay, so it means heat, it's because of random kinetic energy. So it's going to rub against the atmosphere, which is good for us. Okay, it's protecting us. So most of the time, if the uh, meteorite is not too large, it will disappear into the atmosphere, disappear in dust and gas. Okay, it's getting so hot that the solid turns into gas. But times to times, you have such a big, 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 big meteorite that it will hit the earth. And when it hit the earth, all that kinetic energy turns into a huge crater. And all the dust can go into the atmosphere, blocking the sun for decades. So that's what happened in 65, 65 million years ago. Most of the life on Earth was wiped out. 
So when you have those huge monsters hitting the Earth, that's when you can have mass extinction on Earth. So this is such an amount of energy that when we want to kind of comprehend how much energy will be delivered to Earth when it's going to hit the Earth, we talk into equivalents of TNT. Okay, so just to give you an idea, the bomb, Hiroshima bomb, okay, wiped out Hiroshima, was 15 kiloton of TNT. So that will be the atomic bomb. Okay, and 15 kiloton of TNT, that's that that's a lot. It destroy can destroy a city, it does destroy a city. So I don't know if I have a picture. Okay, so that was after the bomb uh, dropped on Hiroshima. You see nothing is left so just to give you an idea how much energy is 15 kiloton of tnt the only thing that was left behind was a church i think there was a church left behind here um, this is a colored picture hiroshima i think one of them is a church i forgot which one but you see people say oh hiroshima it caused cancer no you didn't have time to develop cancer most people who died, like 100,000 people who died, it was from the bomb, okay? From the consequence of the bomb. In those cases, you don't have time to develop cancer. Like, you, you dead because of the bomb. So that was just to give you an idea. 15 kiloton of TNT, of course, can wipe out Miami, for example. Then you had another bomb. So that bomb here was easy to make because it's uh, uranium. It's not that hard to make a uranium bomb. What is hard is to get the right uranium because you have isotopes of uranium. So you have to enrich uranium, okay? So that was the whole story about the Manhattan Project, if you know about history, when the, um, they were working on the atomic bomb. And then the next bomb that they dropped, I think one, was enough, okay, they made their point. Not sure it was necessary to have two, but anyway, the second one, they were also testing the technology, was one that was dropped on Nagasaki. So Nagasaki was more TNT, so 25 kilo, kilo means a thousand ton of TNT, and that was not the same technology. So this bomb was plutonium bomb. Plutonium bomb is a thousand times more energy than uranium, potentially. So Nagasaki, I don't know if I have a picture here. Nagasaki, here. Okay, so no, it's, it's not cancer. We are not talking about cancer, okay? Everything is destroyed. Nothing is left behind. Okay, and then after World War II, it, it was a race to the hydrogen bomb. So hydrogen bomb, these are the bombs we are using today. I mean, possibly, luckily, hopefully they're not going to use it, but they are thermonuclear weapon. Okay, one hydrogen bomb that they use today that some countries have, it's about up to 100,000 kiloton of TNT to 1 million um, megaton of TNT, so one million ton of TNT. Okay, so that will be a typical hydrogen hydrogen bomb. The largest bomb ever tried on Earth that was done by the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and it was nicknamed Tsar Bomba. Okay, Bomba because of a bomb Tsar, because of the Tsar, and it was 50 to 60 megaton of TNT. Okay, so nowadays it's about 100 kiloton of TNT or one megaton of TNT. So why are we talking about that? You might ask why we are talking about bomb because that's the unit they use to understand the damage that could be done if a meteorite hit the Earth, and that happened 65 million years ago. You have a meteorite about 10 kilometers. The size was 10 kilometers, so between South Beach and South Side, for example, that's a very big one, hitting the Earth. Because most of it will evaporate in the atmosphere. Whatever is left was 10 kilometers in size. And here, 
look at that 100 million megaton so we are talking about 100 million h bomb 100 million thermonuclear uh, head or, or missiles okay so everything died on earth so we'll uh, we'll talk about that in the coming slides but it's a huge amount of energy why because it's all kinetic energy with the speed square turning into damage okay delivering all that energy <laughs> So it, it could come from, it could be an asteroid. So we have a lot of asteroids here. So sometimes maybe Jupiter is pulling on it. Sometimes there is some disruption and those asteroids can leave their orbit and has our name on it. It can be also from, um, you have also asteroids here uh, sharing the orbit of Jupiter. Okay. Now, asteroids are really pieces of junk. So if you take all the asteroids and you put them together, you will not get even to Pluto, be like something very small. So asteroids, usually they, look, they, they do look like potato, you see, like this, and they rotate. So this one, we already talked about it. It's 10 kilometers in size. So that could be very dangerous for us. And it has its own little moon here. So we already talked about that. Um, Ceres, remember, was the first one ever spotted. And first it was a planet, and then it was demoted to be an asteroid. In 2006, it was promoted again to be a dwarf planet. And um, dwarf planet like Pluto, uh, sadly, it has its own moon. Remember last time I was not sure what Charon was. In mythology, Greek mythology, it's the god that take people uh, to the afterworld. Okay, so there is he, he has like a boat. Maybe it was a kayak. Who knows? And take people in in uh, his boat and have them cross a river to take them to. I don't know if they had heaven or hell, like the, the afterworld, right? So his name was Charon. You see Ceres is here, and that's going to be the Earth 1 AU. Okay, so we'll talk about that more next time. <laughs>